Right, next, you have a little tiny bill called Assembly Bill 287 uh, that um, we've been focusing some time on. Uh, Mr. Gordon, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking the committee for the thoughtful analysis and the suggested amendments to strengthen the consumer protection aspects of this bill. Briefly, those amendments found on pages 11 and 12 of the analysis would have the rental car provisions of this bill track pending federal legislation. It would ensure that this bill does not undermine existing consumers' legal rights, and it would ensure that loaner vehicles provided to consumers have recalls repaired. I would like to take those amendments as author's amendments. In 2014, there were nearly 64 million vehicles in the United States subject to recall. That amounts to about one of every four cars on the road today. While that number is shocking, early indications are that the number of recalls in 2015 may be even greater. Unfortunately, in many instances, getting the recall service completed is not as simple as calling a franchise dealer and making an appointment. Notification of vehicle owners is a challenge. And even when notice is received and the owner seeks a repair, the manufacturer may not have the requisite parts available, and in some instances, the wait for parts may be several months. AB 287 attempts to comprehensively address the recall issue, albeit in different ways for all vehicles in retail commerce, whether they are sold by a new car dealer, a used car dealer, a private party transaction, or are rented by a rental car agency. The basic concept behind this legislation is that we need to first provide consumers with information so that they can make an informed choice when purchasing a vehicle. That secondly, we need to incentivize the repair of vehicles subject to recall. And third, when necessary, prohibit the sale of some vehicles until the repair is completed. There will be folks appearing in opposition with a position that all cars need to have recalls repaired now. Fundamentally, I agree with the opposition. We do need all vehicles subject to recall repaired as soon as possible. Let me repeat. I agree. However, that is hardly the status quo. And I believe that the approach taken in AB 287 represents what is practical and possible in the current recall environment, where required parts to repair a vehicle may not be available for months after recall is announced, where existing law imposes no restrictions on the sale of cars with an open recall, and where consumers may not be aware of the recall status of vehicles. The approach in 287 ensures that manufacturers and dealers both have skin in the game and that consumers are better informed. Let me walk you through the landscape of existing law and what 287 does. Under existing law, there is no restriction on the sale or rental of a used car with an unrepaired recall. Moreover, there is no requirement of notice to a consumer of the unrepaired recall. Now, I'd note that some companies have voluntarily taken a different approach. The big three rental car companies have agreed to repair recalled vehicles before renting, and these companies should be commended for their re uh, approach. But let me repeat, there is no requirement in law to repair a vehicle or notify a consumer. So AB 287 uh, would inform uh, owners uh, to, uh, to stop driving a vehicle uh, or when car dealers are selling vehicles um, that would prohibit new car dealers, used car dealers, and rental car companies from selling, leasing, or renting those vehicles that are under stop drive, stop sale. Secondly, for recalls designated as stop drive, stop sale, AB 287 would require these entities to check a qualified recall database prior to selling, leasing, or renting any used vehicle to consumers. And if a new car dealer, such as a Ford dealer, has a used Ford on his or her lot, uh, because that dealer is in the best position to see if the vehicle is repaired, AB 287 would prohibit the dealer from selling that vehicle until the recall is repaired, regardless of how long it may take. If a vehicle is not of the same line as a dealer's franchise, such as a Ford dealer having a used Chevy on their lot, or if it's for sale by a non-franchise car dealer, AB 287 would require the dealer to disclose the recall to the consumer, provide a copy of the recall notice, and inform the consumer that he or she can get the recall repaired at no cost at a car dealer of the vehicle's make. 
As noted above, the big three rental car companies have pledged to ensure that all rentals are repaired. As the bill will be amended pursuant to the committee's analysis, AB 287 would largely track a pending federal bill that would require vehicles to be repaired or the recall prompting defect mitigated prior to even renting the vehicle. The federal bill is supported by the big rental car companies and numerous consumer groups, including some that are currently opposing this bill. For private party sales, which amount to 60% of used car sales, AB 287 would require private party sellers to inform potential buyers of any and all recalls prior to sale, similar to the current requirement around odometer disclosure. Finally, AB 287 would require auto manufacturers to provide consumers with a loaner vehicle at their request and at no cost when consumers seek to get a recall corrected and the parts or procedures are not available for repair. Uh, the committee analysis did an excellent job in characterizing some of the challenges with a bill that attempts such a comprehensive solution. And the amendments today, I believe, strengthen the bill, but I will admit that there is more work moving forward. Colleagues, the bottom line is that it appears that we've entered a new era of increasing auto recalls. Existing law fails to require that dealers repair any recalls, that vehicle purchasers are notified of an open recall, or that consumers are provided with an optional owner while awaiting repairs. I would respectfully request that you join Assembly Members Eggman, Jones, Stone, Wilk, and me, and vote aye on AB 287. And I do have witnesses. Terrific. Let's go to your first witness. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Cliff Costa, on behalf of the California New Car Dealers Association, I'd like to thank Assembly Member Gordon for doing an excellent job describing what the bill does. So instead, I'll take uh, a moment of your time to explain why car dealers, especially California's new car dealers, are sponsoring this measure. Uh, for the past several years, California's new car dealers have faced uh, a piece of legislation that failed to pass this House um, that was, an, was overbroad and was a one-size-fit-all solution. Following those bills failure to uh, pass we decided that it was time for California's new car dealers to get our hands around the issue comprehensively and to try to address this issue of recalls even though this is not a problem that we created. Uh, AB 287 is the only measure in the country that seeks to address this measure from both new car dealers, used car dealers, rental car companies, manufacturers and private party sellers. The CARS Act is intended to ground the most serious recalled vehicles and form consumers when they are purchasing a vehicle about open recalls and to help provide loaner and rental vehicles to consumers who are your constituents and who are driving around today with open recalls that they cannot get fixed because parts are not available. And with that, I'd like to yield the rest of my time to um, our contract lobbyist, Mike Below. Move sure. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Mike Belode, also on behalf of the California New Car Dealers Association. Uh, Mr. Gordon and Mr. Costa have gone through the comprehensive nature of this, how it does bring in every aspect of retail commerce in vehicles that we can think of. Uh, we've had really robust discussions with many of you and your staff and the majority and minority committee staff. There have been excellent points made, and I wanted to talk about two of them. The first relates to this question of rental cars. And the argument was made that the transaction decision in a rental car uh, transaction is very, very different from a used vehicle. That one will get to the booth, if you will, at the rental car agency, a kid's in tow, you're ready to go to some happy place, uh, happiest place on earth. Uh, at that point, being given a disclosure about the recall status of the car, uh, will be difficult and awkward and may not prevent, uh, present consumers with the best choice or, and time of choice. And frankly, uh, there's some truth to that. The idea is that a, in a car purchase, you have a decision that you can put in the hands of the consumer. When they know what the recall status is, they can choose to walk away. And frankly, we are very sure that consumers, in many cases, will choose to do exactly that. So it did make sense to us. Uh, after discussing it with uh, the committee and with the opposition to treat rental cars differently than the sale uh, by new and used car dealers. Uh, as Mr. Gordon noted, the rental car company should be applauded, not harmed, by uh, voluntarily agreeing not to rent 
recalled cars. And so we do not wish to put the rental car companies to inconsistent federal and state standards. They should be the same. And so we are we pledge to work diligently to make sure that the rental car companies are held to exactly the same standard here in California that they have proposed in the Boxer Schumer bill in Congress. So uh, the two standards ought to be the same and we will work with them to make sure that they are given the credit they deserve for taking this voluntary action. Second, um, with respect to the consumer him or herself, the argument was made that in some way the consumer could actually be worse off if the bill passed by having received a disclosure from a seller that they have there therefore agreed to buy the car and have somehow contributed to their own problem. And that was never our intention. We never wanted the consumer to be worse off than they would have been had they not received any disclosure at all. We want this to help consumers, to give them the information that they need to decide whether to purchase the car or not. So we have worked with the committee and with the opposition, and the language now does takes three important amendments. First, it says that the disclosure has no legal effect on any subsequent litigation except to show that we actually made the disclosure. So that if a question arose, did you hand the consumer the disclosure or not, we can show that we did. But other than that, there is no legal effect on the consumer. They're in exactly the same position they would have been before. Second, to put belts uh, on that suspenders, we say that in no circumstances should the consumer as a plaintiff be worse off as a matter of law than they would have been had they not received the disclosure at all. And third, to further buttress this point, we say that the bill has no effect on existing legal rights or remedies under statutory or common law. So the consumer's ability to be made whole remains whole. And I think that was always our intent and it was pointed out by the opposition, and we were pleased to try to clarify that with the amendments to the bill. So there is no law anywhere, Mr. Gordon said, nothing preventing a dealer now from selling a used car subject to a recall. We are aware of no prohibition in California or nationally, and this is a chance for California to lead. Consumers will be better off with the passage of this bill than they are now where no prohibition exists. So we strongly ask for an I vote. Thank you. Next witness. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Billy Doring, representing the Independent Auto Dealers Association. We represent the used car dealers. Uh, I will try to be brief, as Mr. Costa, Mr. Gordon, and Mr. Below have covered a lot of it. But absence of this bill leaves the consumer with zero protection whatsoever. Uh, last last session, when we had a bill. It just said that that dealers had to disclose the the uh, recall. However, there was nothing to get the recall information from. Now the feds have adopted a database that we can get to prior to us selling the car, notify the customer that there is a recall, and we feel as an industry that we have an obligation to take care of that and make the notica notification. Nobody should get hurt because of a recall. And before we didn't have the tools, now we have it. There's just no reason to uh, oppose this. We would encourage the committee to support it as it does help the consumer because right now, and if this bill fails, the consumer would be worse off than they really are because it's out there. And as it relates to rental car companies, they are to be applauded because rental car companies are no different than a legal owner because they get the notice and used car dealers and new car dealers never get the notice. But now they will. We would urge your support. Thank you very much. Is there public comment and support? Are there witnesses in opposition? Please come forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm a lawyer, a practicing lawyer in San Francisco. For over uh, 30 years, I've represented uh, car buyers in cases involving um, 
dealer fraud cases, lemon law, and that sort of thing. And I'm also here representing the National Association of Consumer Advocates. It's a nationwide association of attorneys who do a, a consumer law generally, and in particular represent car buyers. Um, we oppose this bill. Um, the premise of the author and um, car, car dealers seems to be that right now there's no law, um, there's a void, and we need to fill it with something. Um, they are mistaken on that. They are clearly mistaken. Right now, it is illegal for any car dealer to sell or any vehicle uh, with, that has a, that's unsafe. If it's unsafe, it can't be sold. That's true under the vehicle code. It's true under other statutes. Uh, the implied warranty of merchantability applies to many sales. And so the whole premise of their bill fails. And the problem with the passing this bill, number one, is that it would create a huge uh, exception to that law. Uh, any, ironically, it'd be the cars that have safety defects as, as determined by the manufacturers uh, can be sold. And uh, yeah, there's a uh, notice that's uh, handed to the car buyer, but the problem is consumers don't always understand those things. Sometimes some dealers just say, sign here, sign here, they don't even know what they're signing. They don't read them. And then inevitably they take the car home and there's a, there's a time gap between when they buy it and when the thing can be uh, uh, resolved by the new car dealer. Um, there's an ex I'll give you an example of a case. A fellow named David Clayton bought a uh, Dodge Ram in Visalia in 2013. It's a 2009 used one. Um, Un unbeknown to him, it was subject to a recall, a Chrysler recall having to do with the drive shaft um, disconnecting from the rear axle. And two months later, he's driving down the freeway 60 miles an hour, and that's what happened. Drive shaft falls on the ground, hits a gas tank, didn't blow up. He was lucky nobody got no personal injury. Um, he found out about the recall when his wife, after the accident, his wife uh, checked online and there it was. He talked to the dealer and the dealer said, hey, what about this? And the dealer says, well, gee, we couldn't get the parts. Um, parts weren't available, so they sold the vehicle anyway. So this is bad. This, this bill is on the surface, gee, maybe it helps. No, it hurts. It, it, um, also, there's another factor. The federal government uh, uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, as you know, uh, regulates in this area. Um, they should be weighing in on this bill. It's my understanding they didn't have time to send a representative. Uh, one thing we urge is that the committee hold the bill till a NHTSA representative can show up and give them, give them their views. Next witness. Mr. Chair and members, I'm Rosemary Shahan, President of Consumers for Auto Reliability and Safety, and we're based here in Sacramento. We work on the state and federal levels on a whole range of safety issues, and we're working very closely with Senators Schumer, Boxer, Feinstein, and McCaskill, and others um, with our allies in the rental car industry um, to enact federal legislation um, that would apply in every state regarding rental cars. And we've also been working closely with the Obama administration, which has a very strong position um, at the U.S. Department of Transportation and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, calling for rental car companies and used car dealers to um, adopt the same good practices and not to either rent or sell unsafe cars to consumers. Under existing federal law, it's a federal crime for a car dealer to sell a new car that is under a safety recall. And there is, while there is no equivalent federal statute that prohibits that yet, um, there are two bills that have been introduced in Congress, one by Senators Markey and Blumenthal in the Senate and the other in the House by um, Representative Schakowsky that would create that same bright line standard. And it just says when it's under safety recall, the dealer should fix it before it goes out on the road. And we would um, encourage the car dealers to get behind that legislation instead of coming to states like California and trying to undermine um, the, the administration and you know, the attempts in Congress to Im improve safety across the board. 
And there should be no question um, that this bill would create a standard that actually makes absolutely no sense. You know, you've heard the author and the proponents say that the intent of the bill is to make sure that vehicles that have serious safety recalls are addressed and that um, in the case of other recalls that consumers would get notice. But it's important to know that when it comes to do not drive, there is no federal standard regarding do not drive. There is no federal definition. There is no mandate. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration does not have the authority to um, tell auto, auto manufacturers that they have to tell their customers not to drive their cars. And there are real practical reasons why manufacturers are reluctant to do that. You know, cars are not like toasters and other consumer products. People depend on their cars to get to work. There's just a practicality issue there where, you know, even if the car is terribly unsafe and known to be terribly unsafe, it's just not practical to tell millions of people overnight suddenly you can't drive your car. Um, so it, it, I, I brought a chart that shows, um, this is in response to a letter that Senator Boxner and Senator McCaskill sent to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration asking the NHTSA authorities to require data from the manufacturer regarding do not drive. And historically, when they have chosen to opt to advise their customers, it's not a mandate, they can't tell you, can't use your own property. It's their advice to the consumer. And um, if I could give this to the sergeant, please, to hand out so you can see the chart for yourself. Sure, we're happy to accept the handout. And, um, and we're gonna go to the next witness okay. um, in opposition. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Nancy Peverini on behalf of the Consumer Attorneys of California. We did have an oppose, oppose, oppose unless amended position. We'd like to look at the amendments with our with our members and see you know if that changes our position. But I would like to thank um, the author and the sponsors for at least taking some of the amendments we off, we asked for regarding um, making sure that that evidence is that information that somebody signed a waiver isn't then admissible against them because it could really harm them in a subsequent proceeding. We agree with the opposition that it'd be really helpful to have somebody from NHTSA weigh in on this. Um, but at this point, we'd like to review the amendments. And thank you very much. Got it. Thank you. Uh, is there a public comment in opposition? Seeing none, questions or comments from the panel? Uh, Mr. Lowe, no? Mr. Dubovnik. I actually have um, a question for each side. And maybe I can start with Cliff or Mr. Gordon. It seems that this would obviously affect obviously new car dealers and those that sell on used car lots. We also have a growing marketplace where people are selling cars directly, third party private buyers. How would this law affect their requirements when they're selling a private car or also if they're in the business of selling cars? I mean, if they're not, right now I've seen people that are kind of popping up selling cars over the internet. You can buy a car on Craigslist. You can buy a car through a number of different websites. Uh, it's obviously not on a dealer's lot. How does this change the requirement? I know we have odometer reading requirements for individuals selling cars. How would this affect that? And then afterwards, I, I do have a question for the consumer advocates as well. Mr. Chair, again, Mike Belote for the California New Car Dealers Association. Uh, fully 60% of all used cars in California are sold by private parties. That is non-dealers. Uh, to other consumers. And we are working with DMV to fashion an approach where private party sellers can make the same lookup on safercar.gov and give the information to private party buyers. It is tricky because if they don't do it, uh, it is not our intent to prohibit registration of the car yeah. to the poor person who bought the car and now can't register it. So the we are working to do an odometer type disclosure in transfer documents somewhere probably on the pink slip that would require the seller to tell the buyer what they learn about the condition of the car. Is, it seems to me that in the long run, a little bit more of the burden is going to have to go on the consumer buying a car. If you're going to take the risk of buying a used car, there's things like True Car and Carfax now that look up the history of the car that seem to be very worthwhile products. Is it possible now for an individual consumer, whether they're going to buy that car on a lot 
or they're going to buy it over Craigslist or from their neighbor who's got a for sale sign on a car in front of his house. Can an individual access the database now to look up the recall? And is there any way to put in the car's VIN number or license plate to see if that car has had the fix that's needed? Yes. The answer, the answer is very clear and simple. And this is a major change since last year's bills. Uh, since last year, uh, under federal law, we have a new federal database. Uh, you look it up under safercar.gov. You put your 17-digit VIN into the system, and if you have an open recall, it pops up. It apparently is working well. Uh, if, you, if you had a recall and it's been fixed, your VIN will not pop up. So we are moving towards an era where consumers will have information and it's easy to get. Uh, and they're, in that sense, as empowered as dealers to find out the recall status of the car. Can you, can you send me some more information? I'd like to get that to my Happy district. And, and for my and I, I apologize. I, I did not catch you the way your names. Um, several times you mentioned how this would undermine the federal law or undermine current law, make consumers less safe, and really give them less of an ability to get a recourse if there is some type of, um, uh, if they've been wronged. But you didn't really go into much in terms of details or specifics. I heard several times you talked about how this will undermine the law. I heard several times how this will make consumers less protected. I didn't hear any specifics. Could you address under your first scenario, the, the gentleman uh, who, who represents the consumer advocates, how would the scenario that you told us about the gentleman who's steering column, or I forget the exact situation, his car malfunction, how would this current law have made his situation worse? I mean, it seems like you described a bad situation that happened to a customer under current law, but I don't see how that really plays into your opposition to the bill today. How would this current law have made this situation worse, and, and how has this undermined current law? I'd like some actual tangible, real evidence, because you, you, you let's be honest, you kind of uh, really, you know, oppose the bill based on to me, just an idea this is somehow going to undermine current law without giving very hard examples of how. Well, in a given situation, you know, it, it could, it could um, be an improvement. Here's the, here's the problem with these notices and disclosures. Sophisticated consumers, yeah, okay, but they're, they're, not, they're not the great mass of car buyers. The great mass of car buyers don't, don't understand these things. Um, they don't act on them. Um, and also, but more important in the example I gave, the parts weren't available. So if somebody gets that notice, it wouldn't have done any good because the parts weren't available. And what, what should happen is the dealer should have to hold that vehicle until it gets fixed before they can sell it. Yes. And to um, address that specific example that um, Mr. Anderson mentioned, in David Clayton's case, he hired an attorney in Fresno who represented him, who brought a cause of action against the dealer under the California Legal Remedies Act, um, 17200, Unfair and Deceptive Acts and Practices, and um, a number of other statutes. And he was a, um, they reached a negotiated confidential settlement in that case. Um, at the earlier hearing, a witness who testified against the bill was Kelly Houck, who lost her two daughters in a recalled vehicle. And in her case, she sued both Chrysler and the rental car company that had rented the car without fixing the recall. By the way, the recall in Mr. Clayton's case was not a do not drive. The recall that killed Rachel and Jackie Houck was Donna do not drive. Um, and, you know, that's typical of 99% of the safety recalls that would be um, un under this bill. Dealers would be allowed, affirmatively permitted, to sell vehicles that have defects like catching on fire, the wheels fall off, the airbags explode in your face and um, spew shrapnel into your face. Um, the seatbelts don't work when you need them. You know, no question that these are life-threatening safety defects. And one of the concerns that we have with the bill is that it's inherently misleading and irresponsible for any, you know, for an industry to be saying these are not serious safety defects. The rest of the entire community, the manufacturers are trying to get to 100% compliance with the the recalls. They're not, you know, dividing them up between do not drive, which is like 
practically mythical, um, and all the other recalls, we're concerned consumers are going to get the message. The state of California has decided these vehicles are not such a big threat. You can go ahead and buy it. When you put people on the road in these cars, there's no way to know when the defect will occur. Sometimes people have been killed the same day or within hours of when the key is put into their hands. And, and if we may, um, let's ask Mr. Belote to address some of those concerns. Just very, very briefly, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we make it very clear that none of the causes of action mentioned by Ms. Shahan or by Mr. Anderson other, under statutory law or common law are affected in any way by this bill. So if it's a common law fraud action or uh, misrepresentation or if it is a statutory claim under the Consumers Legal Remedy Act or 17200, it is preserved. Got it. I'll get to you in a second, Mr. Wilk. Could, could somebody, it uh, doesn't matter if it's the proponents or opponents, let the committee know how many recalls occur every year? Sure. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, last year was 63.8 million recalls in the, state, uh, in the entire United States. That was twice as many as any year previously in history since 1966 when recalls started. Uh, last, so 2014 was 63.8, 2013 was 22.6, I want to say, 22.4, and in 2012 it was something like 16 million recalls. So uh, recalls have definitely um, increased. So that's 172,000 a day. Correct. Okay, so, so and, and I think that's what this bill is trying to get at, unless I'm mistaken and the, and the analysts up here are mistaken. And there are recalls that are, and, and this bill does distinguish between safety recalls, not, not using NHTSA terminology, but using California's own terminology. It distinguishes between, it's my understanding, safety recalls and things like a dome light is broken and the, we're holding up commerce because of that dome light. So and, maybe. And Mr. Chair, um, and that's why we're concerned about the bill. That's one of the key reasons we oppose the bill, because that... Is the dome lights, or...? No, <laughs> because um, the recalls where the dealers would be permitted to sell the cars, where people have a reasonable expectation when they go to a dealer, he's not selling them a car with a lethal safety defect, um, that the manufacturer has acknowledged is defective and needs to be repaired to be safe to operate. Um, the, this bill would allow them to sell those cars. And they're not, it's not for petty reasons that they're being recalled. The main reason we're seeing more recalls now, Mr. Chair, is that um, we know, for instance, with the GM ignition switch, GM illegally concealed that defect from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They're paying dearly for that. Um, so, you know, as a result, you know, this is the, where the switch switches off. You lose power steering, you lose power brakes, sure, and your sure, airbags I mean, but don't sure, work. Surely the 66 million recall, I mean, That's it's been explained to me. That's 2.9 million it, right, cars. Right, but it, it's been explained to me by some of the federal officials that you stated you wanted to be here today that the term safety recall is a bit redundant, that every recall is a safety recall. Uh, and that if a dome light is broken, they have to express that as a safety issue as well, uh, which, which means that there really are different classes of recalls. There's, there's an ignition, there's a braking error, and then there's a dome light that's broken. True? False? I, I see some people nodding. I see some people. Uh, well, dome Costa, aren't the subject uh, okay. of safety recalls. I mean, they're just not. They're the subject of a technical service bulletin to the dealer to... I'll help them fix it when somebody brings it in, but they, they, they don't fall under the Safety Act. They don't fall Mr. under the Costa, federal law. I, or Mr. Gordon, I, I, you, sure. Yeah. yeah. First of all, um, manufacturers are um, have been switching from issuing these technical recalls to dealers and putting everything or, or technical notice or a correction notice. They've been making everything a recall. That's why the number is going up. Um, and w in this bill, we use the only definition available, which is the federal definition of, um, you know, do not drive. Um, and so, um, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, consumers will have the information they need uh, to make uh, the appropriate decisions. And if I can add, Mr. Chair, sure. dealers are selling these cars today. <laughs> Today, the, the consumer is blind when they walk into a dealership, 
and they're not being told about recalls at all. This bill does something. It grounds the most serious where the manufacturers have said, do not drive this vehicle. When the dealer has been told through the recall notice, do not sell that vehicle. And <coughs> then the consumers are told about every other available recall. This is not, we're not intending to try to bury the document, bury the disclosure. We're trying to inform the consumers to have better know than what they have today. There's nothing that requires dealers to do anything today. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Wilk, who had a question. Well, actually, the point I was going to bring up is what the author just did. It, the manufacturers have gone from doing, issuing these technical notices to s safety recalls. I, I don't know about you, but every car I've gotten is, is, is improved in reli uh, reliability uh, over the years. So here's what I walk away with on this bill. One, I don't have any confidence in the federal government to act on this or act on this quickly. Two, we've... Uh, I served on BNP the last two years. We've, we've taken stabs at this. I um, think it was very, uh, very broad brushed um, and wasn't going to accomplish what we needed to accomplish. I think this is a very nuanced piece of public policy, which actually does protect uh, consumers. Is it perfect? You know, you know, probably not, but I would rather come back next year and tweak it than to continue down the path that we're going down, which is no protection for consumers at all. So uh, I salute you for the bill, and I plan to vote for it this afternoon. I guess I'm chair now. Great. Mr. DeBodnick. De 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 I just have one quick follow-up, and I'll try to keep it brief. I do appreciate both sides for the answers to my last questions. If I go onto a used car lot today, or possibly a new car lot, most cars that are used will have either an as-is or under warranty check. If I go into a car lot after this is sold or, pi or buy from a private individual where I have far less information on the car unless I do the research myself, will that car sticker now include something that talks about warranties? Will it have to say something like, well, obviously, if it has a warranty issue, it probably couldn't be certified or have a warranty if it had an outstanding recall. But would it have some kind of notification on the car at the time of sale that would highlight the fact that there is a, a recall pending or an issue with the car? Mr. Bond, the, the, the bill sets out very clearly that we have to disclose to the buyer prior to sale. Um, we are committed to continuing to work with you and to work with others to try to define exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but at this point, the bill says, you can, I have to give you the, the disclosure and tell you there's a, a recall on, on the bill, uh, or excuse me, on the vehicle. I got to provide you a recall notice, the actual recall notice issued by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And then you have the choice to either sign the document acknowledging that there, you are aware of the recall and that you can go get that recall repaired for free at a vehicle dealer of the same line make, or you can walk away from the transaction. Could I? I'm going to give you a chance to face, but let me just do one follow-up on that. And currently, proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And currently, your dealers don't have to do any of that. And also, I know you mentioned earlier that they do have a burden not to sell cars that they knowingly have issues. But now, not only do they have an obligation to, under this new statute, they'd have to also look up to see if there was a defect. So they'd have to proactively check the database, which is something they would not have to do today. Correct. Okay, now I'll let you finish. Okay, I'm not a lawyer, um, so full disclosure on that. But um, you know, to respond to your question about when the notice would be given, under the bill, the dealer could advertise as CarMax does. All our vehicles have to pass 125 point inspection, they're in top condition, get you onto the lot. And then four hours later, after you pick out the individual car, they would provide you with a copy of the recall notice, which, unlike um, Mr. Acosta said, is not issued by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It's issued by the manufacturer. The NHTSA signs off on the language. It's very legalistic. It's only in English. It doesn't say very relevant information about how many people have been injured or killed, or that you in particular may be more vulnerable. For instance, with the, um, the Takata airbag, or the, the GM ignition switch defect, 
many of the victims are young women because they don't have the upper body strength when the power steering and power bakes go and the airbag is no longer working. Um, when you look at the fatalities and injuries, they're more vulnerable. So what you're doing is putting the consumer in a position where they're being asked to make a life or death decision based on very complete information. And at the earlier hearing, a young person testified who, about his buying experience where he purchased a, a PT Cruiser that had the same um, recall that killed Rachel and Jackie Houck. As when he turned 18, it was his first car. He was excited about buying his first car. He since has seen the recall notice and he testified, look, as an 18-year-old buying my first car, I figure if I'm getting it from a dealer, it must be safe. Well, I'll just close by saying to the author, I, I will support your bill today. I think it's a good bill. I think providing more information to the consumer is always a good idea. I do understand some of the concerns of the advocates here today. Uh, I would love to see more specific language in the near future about when, at what point during the sales transaction, as early as possible, hopefully the notice will be made available to consumers. Uh, but I do think that providing more information to consumers is always a step in the right direction. All right, let's go to Mr. Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make a comment. First, I want to thank the author for bringing this. I think this is proactive, a common sense approach to educating consumers on upfront more than what they have today. And I would move this bill, Mr. Chairman. Right. Bill's been properly moved and seconded. Are there any other questions from the panel? I just want to thank you for uh, for working on this bill. I know that um, you and your co-authors have a reputation around here for working on consumer protection measures. And um, to the extent that this uh, this house gives people um, uh, the benefit of the doubt based on the authors, uh, you certainly have it because of your past history, um, along with Ms. Eggman and Mr. Stone and Mr. Jones and all the terrific bipartisan team you have on this bill of uh, working for ma measures that I think are in the benefit of the consumer. Uh, personally, I think this is on the right track. I think it's a step in the right direction to uh, to providing more information to consumers. I, too, would like uh, to share what Mr. Dababne say, said, which is perhaps we, we need to make it clear in the bill as it moves forward that it's in a conspicuous manner, or it could be just adding one word to the bill language. Uh, but I thank you for working with my committee staff. You took a number of amendments that I think make this a strong bill for consumers. Um, and uh, with that, I'll ask you if you'd like to close. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let me assure both you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Dababne that um, uh, I will be working to try to make sure that we get this notification to consumers as early as possible. Um, you know, I, I don't want somebody to be on a, a used car lot, fall in love with a car, and, and then be put in some position where, you know, oh, now I'm told. No, I think it has to occur early, and we're working to figure out what's the best way to do that. Um, and I'll continue to work on that. Um, the, um, I just, in closing, would, would remind you that, you know, that there's currently in California no restriction on the sale or rental of a used car with an, uh, that's under a recall. Uh, there's no requirement of notice to a consumer that there's been a recall. Um, and I'm not one who wants to wait for, Cal for federal law to protect California consumers. And so with that, I would um, uh, urge an I vote. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass as amended to appropriations. Gatto? Aye. Gatto, aye. Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Baker? Calderon? Aye. Calderon, aye. Chang? Aye. Chang, aye. Chow? Aye. Chow, aye. Cooper? Dababne? Aye. Dababne, aye. Dolly? Aye. Dolly, aye. Gordon? Aye. Gordon, aye. Low. Your bill is passed. We will hold the roll open for others to add on. Thank you very much.